morning, everyone. Thanks to Sarah and the organizers for the opportunity to talk. So I'm going to be talking about interpreting the antibiogram this morning. And I think this is a very underused resource in our setting. And in fact, is one of increasing relevance for the era of increasing antimicrobial resistance. So I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Chibabai for sharing some of her slides with me. So this is the outline. I'll talk about some terminology and approach to antimicrobial, empiric antimicrobial therapy, and then we'll delve into the actual antibiogram itself. So in terms of terminology, um, I think we're probably familiar with most of these terms. Empirical therapy refers to antimicrobial agents that are given when there are features of infection, but it's prior to the availability of the patient's culture results. So it's based on what the most likely pathogens are, and this is where the knowledge of local epidemiology comes in, what the site of infection is, and then what the known susceptibility patterns in that unit or that specific hospital or practice is. Directed or targeted therapy, on the other hand, is when antimicrobial agent therapy is based on actual culture and susceptibility results for an individual patient. Prophylaxis is to prevent infection. It's really there are very, very specific indications for the use of prophylaxis, and I think this will be discussed further um, later this morning. Escalation of therapy, when we're changing up to an antibiotic agent with a broader spectrum activity, for example, moving from keftraxone to meropenem, and then de-escalation, where we sh shift down to narrower spectrum activity, for example, from amoxicillin clavulanate to ampicillin. Preemptive therapy, that's a very niched area. So this is when antimicrobial agents are given against a specific pathogen in higher risk patients. And this is prior to the development of symptoms. So I think the example that we're all familiar with is the use of preemptive GAN liver therapy in selected transplant patients to prevent CMV infection, either because they're known to be colonized with CMV or they've been transplanted um, an organ from someone who's known to be um, CMV colonized. So this is the Charlotte Antimicrobial Suture Program prescription chart. And I've put it up, it's the first page, just to point out that on the left-hand side is the PED, which is the prophylaxis empiric or directed therapy indication. And I think it's very useful. It prompts the prescriber to think about what type of antimicrobial therapy they're prescribing. And as a result, to think about what the spectrum of the antibiotic should be, and it, as well as what the duration should be. And this form I know is used widely um, in many healthcare facilities in Gauteng. It's also quite useful to us from the antimicrobial stewardship perspective. Um, if you're an approver for restricted antibiotics, it immediately puts you into the picture of what the antibiotic is for and also helps us to monitor prescribing trends at our hospital. So a bit more on empiric therapy. It's generally given in two broad scenarios. And the one being when we know there's excess morbidity and mortality associated with the delayed initiation of antimicrobial therapy. And these are in patients with sepsis, meningitis, any kind of severe infection where we know delayed therapy um, is not a good idea, where we want to get in early with the empiric therapy. The other scenario is where we've got infectious syndromes, where the common pathogens are well known, and in fact, individual laboratory diagnosis is not indicated. So a typical examples here would be cystitis or non-severe community-acquired pneumonia. When selecting empiric therapy, you're looking to cover the most likely pathogens that are expected for that clinical syndrome, and if you incorporate the knowledge of your local antimicrobial resistance patterns. So just to impress on everyone, it's not the broadest cover that you can possibly prescribe. We know that this is where we have selection of unnecessary antimicrobial resistance when we go excessively broad. In terms of optimization, so specifically in patients with sepsis septic shock, we know that we don't want to delay therapy and we're looking to um, start therapy, appropriate therapy within an hour of assessment. Always to send blood cultures before starting antimicrobial therapy if possible, to also send samples from what you think the actual site or source of infection is. Even a single dose of an antibiotic we know reduces the yield from cultures and can potentially result in a missed opportunity to, to identify what's actually causing the patient's infection. In terms of duration, it must be very limited, the empiric therapy duration. So once you have your, anti your microbiology results, we're looking to do targeted therapy where we've got specific culture and AST results to target our antibiotics. If the cultures are negative, 
um, and the patient is stable or an alternate diagnosis has been made, we need to stop these empiric antibiotics. Sometimes cultures are negative, but the patient was had initially presented with severe sepsis. In this kind of scenario, one needs to assess whether you had source control, how early your source control was achieved, what's the patient's clinical response been like, what's the biomarker trend at the moment, and really the aim is to use as short a course as possible. Um, and often we can get away with five to seven days of therapy. So what is an antibiogram? An antibiogram is a summary of common pathogens and their general susceptibility patterns. And the standard is to report it as a percentage susceptibility. Ideally, the data should be from a particular specimen type. And we talk about syndrome specific antibiograms. And an example would be, for example, a respiratory infection antibiogram. So all the data in that specific antibiogram would have been derived from respiratory samples. So sputa, tracheal aspirates, um, bronchial samples. And then there's a general antibiogram when there isn't sufficient data to do a syndrome specific one, where we don't have enough respiratory cultures, for example, then we may do a general antibiogram where you've got pooling of various samples, respiratory, urine, blood culture, and other sites. The antibiogram also is developed for a specific location or a specific patient population. So it may be at the level of the hospital or more commonly um, a unit specific antibiogram. And then there's a specified period of time over which the cultures have been looked at. And important to note that antibiograms need to be updated at least annually so that the data and the epidemiology are reflective of the current um, situation. What are the two main uses of an antibiogram? So to determine the most appropriate empiric therapy to use in a specific patient with an infection, and then also to monitor antimicrobial resistance rates over time. So this is an example of an antibiogram, and this is a general one where there's more than a single sample type that's been included. So if we look at the graph on the left, this is where the summary is provided of what samples made up this antibiogram. And you can see the bulk of samples were in fact urine samples, 78%, and a very small proportion of blood culture, respiratory, catheter tips, and others. So this is typically like an antibiogram would potentially be putting together for I think a urology unit. The graph on the right is illustrating the top pathogens and the percentage contribution of each. So unsurprisingly, we've got E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae as common pathogens. When there's a predominance of urine samples, this would fit. And then the third common pathogen is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So not a typical community acquired antibiogram for sure. Pseudomonas would be something we would see, for example, in a hospital population and like a urology unit at our hospital. So this is the exciting bit. This is the actual antimicrobial susceptibility table. And this specific one is for the gram negatives and the Enterobacterialis specifically. So each row will document the genus and the species of the organism we're looking at. So we've got the top two ones here, E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae. And then in blue, we've got the various antibiotics, the appropriate antibiotics for these pathogens that have been tested. And then the percentage susceptibility, um, which has been highlighted in various colors, depending on how high the susceptibility rate is for that specific antimicrobial agent. If you look at the green tab, we've got a tab that says, says resistance and number of isolates. So that indicates how many isolates were used for that specific species to generate this antibiogram. So the guidelines state that at least 30 species, um, sorry, 30 isolates per species must be included for this to be a valid antibiogram. Obviously, the greater number of isolates you've got per species, the more robust the antibiogram is, as it's more likely to be predictive of what's happening in the unit. Also, under the resistance tab, we've got percentage ESPL and percentage CRE. So usually under that tab, we include resistance mechanisms of interest, and for the enterobacterialis, it would be how many, uh, what percentage of the isolates are extended spectrum beta lactamase produces, and what percentage are carbapenem resistant. So, if we look at the Klebsiella in this setting, we've got 53% ESPL rate and 11.8% CRE rate. So, it just gives you a snapshot um, of the common resistance mechanisms in the unit. So, there are a number of nuances um, regarding antimicrobial resistance that are not apparent from the antibiogram. So the antibiogram is this quick reference or an 
an overall snapshot. And we've put together antibiograms for many units at our hospital. And it's always accompanied by an interpretation report in which um, we'll make recommendations. We'll also discuss a few caveats in terms of the antibiogram. And this is sent together with the antibiogram to the head of unit. So if this isn't done, I think it needs to be requested as often as I said, there are minor little tweaks and things that need to be considered when you're using the antibiogram practically. So when do we use it? We do it when we are looking to select antimicrobial therapy and we're still awaiting our culture results. So ideally one wants to look at an antibiogram from the source of sepsis. So if they suspected urosepsis, you'd like to look at an antibiogram that has been specifically developed using urine data. Similarly, if you're looking at suspected um, pneumonia, you want to look at respiratory data. Um, and this is important because often the spectrum of pathogens that cause UTIs is, can be quite different and the relative importance of those pathogens in terms of how predominant they are in urosepsis versus pneumonia can be quite different. Ideally, you want to use unit level data. We know that within a hospital, the spectrum of organisms and certainly the antimicrobial resistance patterns differ quite widely. What we see in a general pediatric ward is quite different from what we'll see in an oncology unit or in a critical care unit. So if there's sufficient data, the antibiogram should be developed for a specific unit. Um, so it reflects their epidemiology. Just other things to consider when we're using the antibiogram, there's lots of individual patient um, information that needs to be factored in. So is this a hospital acquired infection or is this a community acquired infection? Often when we compile these antibiograms, we don't have data as to whether the pathogen came from a hospital acquired infection or a community acquired infection. Um, we don't have admission data. We don't know if the patient was transferred into Charlotte from another um, healthcare facility. So that is something you need to consider when you're using the antibiogram. Other things to consider is the patient's specific history. So if somebody's had a recent infection or is having recurrent infections, their microbiology history in terms of what they've cultured previously is very important. Similarly, which antimicrobials they've been recently exposed to will also help determine um, empiric antibiotic choices. Other things to consider would be what is the site of infection? What's the patient's severity of illness? Um, are they, is there renal dysfunction? So just to optimize selection of agent and dosing of agent in terms of PKPD as well. So I'm gonna finish off with a case scenario. So we've got a 48 year old who's admitted with a community acquired pneumonia. So the question is, do we need to refer to an antibiogram to initiate antibiotic therapy in this patient? And the answer is no. We use the South African Community Acquired Pneumonia Guidelines, and we'll select an agent based on the severity of illness, the patient's age, um, what underlying comorbidities they have, um, what is, have they had any recent antimicrobial exposure? And the options can range from narrow spectrum ampicillin up to, to caftraxone or moxicillin clavulanate. The patient's got a severe pneumonia, we would consider adding a macrolide as well. So this patient has severe disease requiring mechanical ventilation and he's admitted to, admitted to ICU. After six days on the ventilator, he develops a new onset pyrexia and tachycardia. There's rapid deterioration and he requires inotropes. So there's a suspicion that he has sepsis in three sets of cultures, blood cultures are sent. There doesn't seem to be an obvious source of sepsis and it's thought that possibly it's the central vascular catheter. So again, the question, does the patient need empiric antibiotic therapy? Yes, this um, systemic infection patient is clinically unstable. What do we start? So this is where we refer to the unit's antibiogram. And if you look at the top right-hand corner, we've got the prevalence of the top pathogens. So around 20% of infections caused by Klebsiella pneumoniae, another 20% by E. coli, and Staph aureus, another 20%. So 60% of Infections are made up of those three pathogens. If you look at the actual antibiotic susceptibility tables, on the top we've got Klebsiella, and we look at a very high ESBOL rate in this unit. 71% of the Klebses are ESBL, 16% in fact are carbapenem resistant. The E. coli resistance rates are lower, um, and this is usual. We know that Klebsiella is our most resistant Enterobacterales. We look down at the gram positive table, the Staphylococcus aureus, we're homing in on the percentage of MRSAs, and it's low. Only 8% of Staph aureus isolates in 
bloodstream infections in this unit are MRSA. So based on this um, and our top pathogens, imipenem, if we look at the imipenem, we've got 83% susceptibility for the Klebsiella's, 100% susceptibility for E. coli. And we know that imipenem will certainly provide some cover for an MSSA. So imipenem sounds like a reasonable option. I think in this kind of patient where there's been a requirement for inotropes, one so needs to discuss, do we add a second agent like amikacin, for example, to increase our coverage for a potential Klebsiella CRE? And this is something that would be discussed with the clinician. So in this case, the decision was made to start empiric imipenem. And subsequently at 48 hours, we had um, results showing that both the blood cultures and the catheter tip that was removed uh, are positive with the Klebsiella pneumonia ESBL, which is susceptible to ertapenem, and this allowed for de-escalation of therapy from imipenem to ertapenem. So a few days later, the patient's extubator is clinically stable. He's already completed his therapy for the bloodstream infection, and again, he spikes the temperature. They note that the urine in his catheter bag is cloudy, catheter is in for many days as well. And again, the question, does the patient require empiric antibiotics? And it's an emphatic no. The patient is clinically stable. We have a urinary catheter that potentially can be removed. So in this kind of setting, we're looking to see, is there an obvious source, something that can be easily removed? So remove a vascular line, remove a urinary catheter, assess, are there actually features of infection? If so, one would consider um, submitting a sample to the laboratory, but in general, one is not going to initiate um, empiric therapy in this kind of scenario. So to summarize, antibiograms are important for community onset infections. When you have a patient or pathogen profile that is expected to differ from what our general treatment guidelines usually cover, antibiograms are very helpful for healthcare-associated infections. We know that pathogens and susceptibility profiles for many hospital-acquired infections will differ from unit to unit and between hospitals. So ideally, one wants to have access to a unit-specific antibiogram. Also, ideally, an antibiogram that is specific for a clinical syndrome um, will certainly yield more robust data than when one is using a general antibiogram. Um, and I think something just to consider from our side is really the accessibility of these antibiograms at the clinical interface. So we need to look to see how we can optimize that. Um, and really, how do we best incorporate these antibiograms into antibiotic selection, empiric antibiotic selection um, decisions?